Hello, and welcome to the Bluff Creek Project Podcast. I am Tate Hieronymus. I'm one of your hosts. And today, I am joined by my co-host, Robert Leiterman. Robert, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you. Thanks for actually inviting me on to, to help talk to Shane. It's been a while. I, I love spending time with you, and you you have so much things to talk about, and I love hearing what you have. But we have a great guest tonight, Robert. We have Shane Corson of the Olympic Project. And I've been on Shane's, uh, Shane's podcast, the uh, Monster X Radio, before a couple of times. And, man, Shane's a great guy to have on here as a host and a guest. Sweet. If I, if I understand, you, Shane has his own project. He does Monster X Radio, doesn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's and for anybody who doesn't know Monster X Radio, you should check that out because it's a really cool podcast. It's one of my favorite. It's up there with um, Bigfoot and Beyond, and it's super good. They're, those are the two of my favorite podcasts to listen to. So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Shane Corson. Shane, how are you tonight? I'm doing great, man. Doing great, Dave, or uh, Tate, excuse me. Doing great, <laughs> Tate. Like, That's you can edit that. <laughs> doing great, Tate <laughs> and Robert. Uh, thanks for uh, having me on. It's a pleasure to be here, and um, I'm, I'm big fans of you both, uh, definitely. I think we can say the thanks. same. <laughs> so, Robert, do you, wanna, do you want me to ask the first one, or do you want to go ahead and ask the first question? It's all good to me. Oh, you, you, want, oh, you, you want me to throw the first stone? Okay. Go, throw hey, the uh, well. Yeah, throw the first stone. Make it a pebble, please. <laughs> okay, we'll start out with the pebbles and we'll work way up, you know, in size, you know. Hey, uh, <laughs> the Olympic Project. Uh, how, how long did you guys start the Olympic Project? I, I think Derek Randall's are, uh, really originally initiated that. And so how long has the Olympic Project been, been in operation? It's been in operation um, from around 2009. I, I didn't come into the picture until uh, around 2012. So it had been around basically 2008, 2009. That's when it really uh, was formed. Rich Germo and Derek Randall's uh, founded the Olympic Project. Um, and since then, uh, it's expanded uh, to about uh, 35 members. Um, some very active, some not so active, but a uh, great organization. Just a, a great group of people, like-minded individuals. So yeah, been been around for a little while now. Great. Uh, like, uh, you're familiar with the Bluff Creek Project. We've been putting a bunch of cameras out. We didn't start yeah. officially with that until like 2012. But, but you, when you guys first started there with the uh, Olympic Project, I know you had a bunch of cameras out. Eventually, you guys got just certain them out. And about how many cameras are you guys running now out in the field? It's, um, yeah, it's definitely a lot less. Uh, our focus now is less. We do do a lot of camera work. Uh, but it's yeah. kind of shifted gears. So we, we don't focus so much on cameras. Uh, you know, like I said, originally, like you said, Robert, uh, it was a camera trap project and they, they had 50, 60 cameras out over the many ridges in the Olympics, different areas, uh, but scaled way back. At any given time, we had probably, you know, 10 to 20 cameras out. Uh, right now, it's, uh, we're kind of uh, revamping. We don't have a whole lot of cameras out at the moment, kind of shifting gears, but uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll get our, our cameras back out there. Um, of course, I know you guys are heavily involved with uh, the camera work down there in Bluff, Bluff Creek, which is fantastic. Uh, uh, some of the stuff you guys have captured, like the Martin, it's amazing. And uh, shows you the power of and, and the, uh, the usefulness of, of cameras, regardless of Sasquatch. Yeah. But, you oh, know, yeah. It's funny like w that you say that. It's like when, when I was kind of – New to Bigfooting, I just moved from Mexico. Well, I'm originally from the Midwest, Iowa or Missouri. Then I moved to Iowa, then Mexico, then California. And then when I moved to California, I was like really wanting to, to go to the film site. And then I got in touch with Stephen Strayford of the of Bigfoot Books and Bluff Creek Project, and that was the first I heard of them. But I think before that, I've heard of the Olympic Project. Before that, and those were the really you, the Olympic project you guys and the Bluff Creek project were the only two projects that I knew were doing like camera work trying to do uh, Bigfoot so it's like when I, when I think of Pacific Northwest I think of Bluff Creek and Olympic project yeah I mean uh, I mean and don't get me wrong there's other individuals out there there's other groups um, there's some amazing individuals uh, that are running solo doing camera work there's other um, groups 
that aren't, I guess, so well known, but they're doing really good, good things out there. And I got to give them credit. And there's a lot of them. Um, and, you know, it's a, you know, this isn't a solo act when it comes to the Sasquatch phenomena. You know, I learned that many years ago. I thought, oh, I, I could, I could do this. I could be the one. And, and then uh, after, <laughs> a, after I had a, a, an encounter that really solidified the existence of these, these, uh, these things, these entities, these beings, these animals, whatever you want to call them. Um, and then, uh, you know, I thought, oh, I can do this. I know where they're at. Well, no, I was way wrong. And, and that's, that's what led me to the Limp Project and looking at other groups that have been doing it uh, far longer and individuals far longer than I've been doing it. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of good groups. But definitely when I think of the Pacific Northwest, I think Bluff Creek Project, uh, Limp Project, and a few others for sure. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so, Shane, um, how, many, how many guys do you have on the Limp Project team? Uh, it's, it, it's about between 35 and 40 right now. Yeah. Um, and, uh, (laughs) that's a lot of people. (laughs) Yeah. But a lot of them are, um, they're active. We have a lot of active members. We have a lot of people that, um, can't leave their house. So they're, they're more of the, the historical, um, components to, you know, and the researchers online books. And so it's pretty broad. I mean, there's a core group that consists of about, uh, six of us that's really the ones that get out in the field all the time and do the hiking and exploring and the experiments and all that stuff. There's that kind of core group, but exponentially, you know, we have a lot of loose members that uh, give us feedback um, and do a lot of the online stuff. And then, you know, uh, you know, we got members even not outside of Washington state uh, in Ohio and Georgia uh, that keep in touch with us and share what they're doing in their areas. And so it's kind of, kind of neat that way. You know, it's um, similar to some other groups, but, you know, when you look at some of the other groups, uh, some of the larger groups, specifically one, we're, we're relatively small, but uh, not as, you know, I know the Buck Creek. I mean, how many members do you guys have? I forget. Do you guys have 10 or so or more? What is it, Robert? It was I, think, like... I think about eight's a good number that say, that say relatively active, about eight. Eight, and yeah. And like... Yeah, and it's like how many of those people actually sit down at the at the screens and check all the videos, hours of videos, you know, hours of, of photographs, looking to see if anything exciting has crossed across in front of the lens. By the way, uh, Shane, uh, who in your group gets to, gets the privilege to look at all those photographs and videos? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I would say that it's uh, it's funny. Uh, so. D- we- we kind of split it up. Uh, Derek Randall's does a lot of that. I do a, a ton of that. Chris Spencer of the Olympic project does a lot of that. Todd Hale of the Olympic project does a lot of that. So we kind of split it up. Um, a lot of us maintain our own kind of camera areas uh, in the Olympics and, mm-hmm. and elsewhere. So uh, we kind of split it up, but it, it, you're right. It's tedious. It's hours and hours of work going back and rewatching and rewatching and and uh, why did this get triggered, uh, you know, and then and also perfecting your camera use, you know, uh, okay, well, I didn't realize the, the growth in that area was going to get this tall, uh, you know, and then the wind was going to blow and you get 100 shots of this, or, um, you know, you're in a really heavily traveled deer area, which, you know, you're not necessarily looking for, but it's kind of neat to get. So, I mean, there's so many components to camera work. A lot of people are saying, oh, I just go stick it on a tree. Well, what, uh, what heights, <laughs> what heights? You know, what, uh, what's the weather going to be like? What's the growth going to be like in that area? And you guys, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's a, it's a process. So we oh, kind of no. spread that out. No, I, no, I totally get, I totally get that. Cause when I was up there one year filming for a little film project of mine, they were like, Oh, we should move the camera here. We should move it here. And they're talking about growth in that area. I'm like, I get it now. You know, when you're in an area that's really forested and there's a lot of overgrowth, it can change within a few months, honestly. People don't realize how fast an area can grow foliage and stuff, and then you have to, like, change your camera position. Especially, it's- yeah, I was going to say, especially, like, in a river basin, you know, especially uh, some of the areas we, we really focus on, river basins, you know, where you got Devil's Club and all these other, uh, you know, huckleberries and stuff, it, you know, in a span of a week or two, uh, it, your camera could be just hidden and gone. Um, and then, of course, if you, depending on the height of your camera and where you have it placed, you, river levels rise and change. So there's so many components to it. And I admire anybody that really takes camera work serious like you guys and, and, and learns the, there, it is a bit of an art. I don't care what you say. It's a bit of an art. Yeah, a lot of people can place them out in their backyards to get deer and all that. But um, 
they can maintain that area. When you go place these cameras on remote areas, uh, you, you can't maintain that area. Mm -mm. And so it's a, it's a real art. It's, a art. it's an artwork and it's a lot of work, but it's fun. And, and it teaches you a lot about camera trap uh, placement. Right. Yeah, we, no, we have this debate. Well said. Oh, sorry to interrupt, Tade. No, you're, you're uh, we fine. Have this debate. You did it again. Hey, <laughs> we, we have this debate that goes on all the time. I like to put cameras a little higher and shoot down because people don't look up. Things don't look up. Uh, Another member of a party likes to keep them low to catch the little, little fur, fur animals. So we always go to that debate. And the other debate is I like to camo it up because years of park ranger work of hiding and catching criminals, we had to hide the cameras. We had to make sure they couldn't be seen. And we, we always have this debate on our team. Should we cover them up and make them hide hard to see and then let snow put vegetation on and, and cover things up? Or do we just put them where you can access them, lock them in a box and put them on adjacent to game trails in certain areas and uh, see, see what happens. So we have that debate all the time. Do you guys have a similar debate with your team? Oh, a absolutely, absolutely. Uh, because um, a lot of, I personally don't strap my cameras to trees. I don't, I just don't strap them. I don't lock them down. I place them in nooks and crannies and, um, you know, in area, you know, I'll, I'll have them focused down. Uh, I'll, I try different, ele, you know, uh, heights and uh, some of the, the group members, uh, you know, like, they like them lower, they like them higher or, and they, most of them like to strap them. They don't want to lose them. I've been fortunate. I've not lost one yet. I've had bears knock them over. I've had uh, raccoons mess with them, possums and all that and bears and all that stuff. But That's, uh, not, yeah, yeah. I just, I don't like to put the strap on them. I like to, and um, you know, cameras nowadays, they're getting so small. You know, if you look back at the old ones, they're, yeah. you know, like a book, <laughs> a big old book, and um, they're heavy, and there's no yeah. hiding them. Well, like, in, and, like, unless you have, like, a rig to set them up to aim them down, like, if you set them up high, you have to kind of aim them down. If you set them low, you got to aim them up. And, like, with trees, you don't really get that because it's only one level. If you strap a camera to a tree, it's going to point – the direction of what that tree is at the angle you put it on or the height you put it on the tree, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I look what I do personally, and I'm not speaking for the OM project or anybody else. I look for stumps, uh, rock outcroppings. Um, I do use trees. If there's, I can wedge it in there. Uh, I look for specific things and what I've been really focusing in on lately, and this is kind of a, a limb project group discussion is, you know, a lot of sightings occur around, I mean, including Patty, uh, occur around um, river basins, creeks. And um, a lot of times when there's, you have those sightings, it, the, either the Sasquatch is surprised or the, the person surprised or both parties surprised, like, oh, you know. And so um, I, maybe it's because there's a lot of smell coming down those rivers and creeks and a lot of noise. So if, if, if in fact, Sasquatch can hear a camera or spot a camera, uh, everything's got to come down to water or come to water or cross water at some point. And a lot of the signs occur in those areas and surprising, you know, on both party side uh, encounters. So I've been focusing on rivers and creeks, placing cameras close to the rivers, not to the point where I'm going to get a bunch of moving water and stuff, but maybe to surprise that, that end, you know, if a Sasquatch decided to come down there, maybe surprise, I've, I've surprised a lot of animals. I mean, they don't even notice it. A lot of times I've noticed, not all the time. I mean, sometimes they notice it, but, I just, yeah. something I'm, I'm experimenting with and I'm sure others have done it. I'm, it's not a novel idea, I'm sure, but something I'm experimenting with and um, based on a lot of historical reports and encounters. So, so Shane, I got to ask you something too. Um, from what you're saying about rivers and, you know, creeks and stuff, do you think that they're more, you're more likely to have an encounter by like a creek area in like a drainage um, in a valley or on a ridge? I, I'll be honest. I don't. Um, I don't know if I have an. I don't definitely don't have an answer to that. I'll say, I focus on ravines. Um, and this really, so this um, idea evolves around the nest study stuff we've been working on for years, and, and impressions we've come across, and and some encounters uh, from other individuals and recordings. Uh, something at some point in time has to come down into those ravines and those um, nooks and crannies and cross. Uh, and plus, you know, I really like to do during salmon, like when you have a heavy salmon run in some of these rivers and creeks, you get some cool shots of all sorts of animals, bears. And that's, you know, it's like Christmas when you get that, yeah. that, that camera and you look at it, you're like, oh, and you see this really neat picture. And I've seen some of the Bluff Creek pictures are phenomenal with the cougars and the bears and, and everything else. Um, and that's 
that's how I feel about it. You know, it, chances of getting a Sasquatch on one of these cameras is really almost no. <laughs> you, yeah. But you hope. And you, you, uh, you just, every time you're looking at, okay, the data, what's the data telling you? What are your best options? And well, you know, you got a lot of food sources down in these areas and I'm just trying to surprise. That's it. It's just catch them off guard. It doesn't stick out way out in the woods. You're in an area where it's noisy. You got movement from the water. You got different smells and different um, wind patterns in that area. And just maybe, maybe you'll get something like a Sasquatch on there. But um, personally, I think, uh, I think lower, uh, you're gonna have a better option at a lower spot. I, when I camp, I'm always, uh, I don't camp on ridges, but I'll camp right below the ridge. I always like to give, you know, Sasquatch the high ground. That's just my opinion. I like to give them the high ground to make them, you, if you're up at their level, you know, just, I just, I think the low ground for, and for most animals, I mean, throw Sasquatch aside, most animals, you give them the high ground and they'll go around you, but they got places to observe you and feel comfortable and not feel nervous. And that's just my approach. So I think ridge, ridges are great. Ravines are great. Uh, who knows? I have no idea. I no, I totally I that, agree with that. Oh, go ahead, Robert. Yeah, that's a, oh, I was just saying that's a really good strategy because uh, we do kind of stand out a little bit. But if we position ourselves where we're vulnerable, then they don't have to be. And we'll get, I think that we'll get more action on the long run with that. So I think it's a great concept. Yeah. And like what Shane said, more or less, it depends on the place you're in, um, really. Because, well, like with the Bluff Creek, we were talking about this last, this past trip. Because um, of the, the, what was it, 64 flood, it kind of blasted out that area. And there was, I think there was salmon in there at one point, but there's not Yeah, anymore. it used to be pretty hot. Yeah. No, they're still there. They're more like landlocked. Uh, they're still salmon days, still trout. But they're landlocked now, pretty much. They can't make the run up the mouth because it's all ripped, ripped to shreds. So, so we yeah, have like the when, initial pop getting better. Yeah, so like when you go up to Bluff Creek, I think the most action happens there on the ridges than down in the creeks. Because there's not a lot of fish for like even the salmon runs for food. It's just mainly a water source. So, I mean... Well, I, actually, I, I, I have to... Not, not to disagree, but I have to add this because you were with us. This last trip, we found good fish populations in the deeper pools up the Bluff Creek over towards uh, Scorpion and stuff. And actually, actually, uh, Rowdy was able to record them underwater with his phone, which is pretty cool. So wow. they're there. They're getting better, which is that's what we wanted to do. It's like when 64 came through, it just devastated the whole area. And it's taking time for it to come back. And it's been, gosh, Tate, you're, you're good with math. 64 minus today's date. Quick, quick, answer, answer, answer. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you're out of there, buddy. Anyhow, it's been a while. So the populations are coming back with the fish, and the pools are deeper. It's The water's digging it back out again because they need those nice, cool, deep pools. There's debris in the creek for hiding and everything. So it's it's turning turn out pretty nice. Hey, uh, yeah. um, hey, Robert. Hey, Shane, I got a question. Hey, let me ask this quick question for Shane first. All right, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's about uh, what cameras do you guys like to use, your game cameras? What's your favorite uh, brand that you like to use? Once again, this is uh, me speaking because, uh, you know, different people like different cameras. Uh, and, and most of us, you know, most of the time we're buying them ourselves. Uh, yeah. We haven't really done any public expeditions that generate a little bit of income for cameras. So we're buying them. Um, I have Bushnell, Stealth are two of my favorites. They're affordable they're small, compact. Uh, we do have some reconnaissance, you know, cameras, um, which are really expensive, you know, like upwards of three, four, 500 bucks. And, but technology's caught up. Uh, some of the, some of the more compelling um, camera photos or video that we've obtained over the years have come off the cheaper cameras. Uh, so I don't know if the more expensive ones are, are worth it, but I, I do, I look Bushnell, Stealth, uh, I've kind of, those are the two I go with. I recently, I bought, and I can't remember the name of it. I just purchased a really, I mean, this camera I just purchased and Chris Spencer of the Olympic project um, brought this to my attention and it's a really small camera. It's a non-name brand I've never heard of. And I decided to spend, it was only like 40 bucks, 30 or 40 bucks. And it's a phenomenal yeah. little camera. And I can't remember the name. It starts with a C, but it takes video. It's got great range. It, uh, uh, you know, has sound. And it's a quarter of the price would you pay for, a, you know, a Bushnell or a stealth camera. 
And so, um, you know, you know, I think you could, you know, start looking at it as technology grows and there's more competition with these cameras and become more readily available and drop in price. There's a lot of up and comers uh, that are just, you know, I mean, a camera that I could fits in my palm, you can hide that really easily. And it's, you know, it's, just, it's amazing stuff. So I, I've been testing that one lately and I'm really happy with the results and I cannot remember the name off the top of my head, but there's other um, models similar to that model on, on Amazon and whatnot. So, but Bushnell and Stealth are my go-to. Awesome. Oh, good. I really, I got, I'm kind of spoiled. I, I started out a long time ago when, uh, when, uh, when, when Hirschman was, was sponsoring camera projects, there's out with Reconics and they could, uh, Randall started out with Reconics too. We were on the two experimental groups looking for stuff. And I still have my old Reconics ones. Like you said, they're like the size of a brick. Yeah, I still have like three that operate. And oh, wow. No hiding. The <laughs> no. But yeah, I got two reason that don't operate. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Tate, I want to ask one last more question since we're talking about cameras and stuff. It's, it's for, Go for, for Shane. It. Yeah. Uh, what is your most exciting, your best rec reconics, not reconics, your best camera trap photograph that you, an animal or something that you captured on, on photo or uh, on video? Uh, j j are you just speaking uh, strictly animal, known animal or? Yeah, Whatever. It, it, anything. It, anything that you thought was crazy that you saw when you went to check your camera trap, you started looking through all those photos and videos. Um, I do have one crazy one, the one that I really like that is, um, so suspicious suspect um I, it seems to be bipedal but i'll get to that one i mean i've gotten some amazing cougar pictures bear um elk deer you um a lot of the known critters and and doing weird stuff you know like wow i didn't know they could do that or you know bears actually <laughs> dancing in front of the camera and you just you know odd stuff like you guys get so i got quite a few of those uh odd pictures um all known animals but i do have um there's one specific one when I moved up to, I used to live in Oregon. I moved up to Washington. And while I was waiting for my house to foreclose, a buddy, uh, James Million of the Olympic Project, had a piece of property in this area up in the, uh, the Olympics that uh, uh, was remote. And I needed a place to stay for about two weeks. So I brought my travel trailer and parked it on his property. And the main reason I parked it on his property is because it was a stone, throws a, a stone throw away from a um, timber gate. And a couple months prior, two different loggers uh, within the span of a couple of weeks at about three o'clock in the morning, waiting for the gate to be opened. They're parked there, saw what they would describe and they don't know each other. These bloggers, they saw what they would describe as a family unit of Sasquatch. And relatively speaking, this is a stone's throw away from our nest area or nest site uh, that we've been working on. So I'm like, yeah, I want to camp there two weeks. I can, I can survive. And mm -hmm. so my wife and my daughter and I did that. Well, I thought, well, shoot, I'll put up some trail cameras and, what I like to do when I have my travel trailer or, you know, if I'm car camping or travel trailing it, I like to put the cameras on the, my travel trailer or my car. So it looks like it's all one unit, nothing sticking out, looking weird camera wise. And so um, for the first uh, week and a half, actually I was out there for three weeks. So the worst first week and a half, almost two, almost two weeks, I got raccoons, um, coyotes, uh, deer, the same two, yep. same two does. I mean, I get the same critters coming through there almost religiously for the first week and a half. And then one night my wife wakes me up and she said, you know, it's just about one thirty-two in the morning. She wakes me up and she goes, Hey, there's something outside and it's messing with our cooler. I'm like, Oh crap. We left our cooler outside. There's a bear. It's trying to get in there. So I heard the ice swishing. I heard the ice swishing and, um, you know, I have a 23 foot lightweight, trailer you can hear everything outside and so i got up and i said it's probably a bear i'll shoo it off so i go outside i look around I see my ice cooler it's been shifted it's been moved but i don't see it's not open nothing and um, i don't see a bear so i come back in i go back to bed i said you know what if it comes back i'll, I'll shoot it off i'll bring the cooler in or put it in the back of the truck or something like that and i said you know what i have three cameras um so i had, I had a camera on the back bumper of my travel trailer about three feet off the ground I had one on uh, my wheel well on this side and one on this side. Well, I said it's probably on camera. So cool. Check it out tomorrow. So I wake up next morning. I'm checking my cameras. I don't have anything on. I don't have anything on the one uh, on, on the front side. I go check the other wheel well. That one had been triggered, but didn't capture anything. Then the one on the bumper 
had been triggered. And then all of a sudden you get this like, uh, and it's an older camera. It was um, a game. I forget the name of it too. It's a game something. Anyway, it was an older camera. Didn't take uh, no sound. And you get what looks like a bipedal figure at 1.32 in the morning walking by it. It looks white because of the flash. But you can tell it's a bipedal figure. I mean, there's, and I, I've done experiments because people have asked me, is it a, could it be a bug? Could it be, you know, this, you know, you name it. And I've, I've actually gone back and done an experiment and walked at different speeds in front of this camera. And I look very similar to it, but smaller. I got the same movement. Um, the camera, the pixelation is slow. So in one frame, you see an arm, what looks like an arm, and it looks triangular in shape. The arm looks triangular in shape. And that's just because it's moving really fast. When I move my arm a certain way, my arm looks exactly the same, but much smaller. And basically what you see is, and it's really close to the camera. That's why it looks all white, a flash. Um, but you see what looks like two legs. You, you probably just about up to the top of the thigh and you see an arm swing by. Would, would I interpret to be an arm? And I could be wrong. Um, there's no guarantees because it's, if it was just maybe five feet further away, it would have been maybe a money shot, maybe. But it was so close. The funny thing was the camera on the side of the trailer was triggered a few seconds before this thing and I'm pretty sure it was the same thing, or maybe it wasn't, uh, came around the back of the trailer uh, and got caught on that particular camera. But like I said before, the, even though the camera on the side was triggered and didn't capture anything, the one on the back was triggered, before, was triggered before that entity or that thing walked by. So something had to, well, either it was the same thing that went back and forth or something else went by there, triggered the camera, and that ent that uh bipedal figure came by and got caught on there but it's a uh, you know I've, I've cliff barrickman's looked at it for me i've sent to a lot of different individuals um they see the same things i see looks like a big a giant thigh it's much bigger than myself i'm about six foot and uh my leg i you can see you can almost you can get way past my waist that's you know at the same distance uh so that for me was the the most and that was back in 2017 in the month of february it was 28 degrees outside I've had people go, well, wow. could, have been a, could have been a person, you know, um, when I walk by with my clothes on, it doesn't matter what speed I do and how close I am to the camera, you can see my clothes. Um, so I had to get naked one day and try it out. And I looked <laughs> much, well, I mean, you know, you got to follow through and, <laughs> funny, but um, you, you can still tell it's me. Um, and some people say uh, when they're looking at the video, they can make out hair. I won't claim that. I can't. I don't think it's good enough. But it's interesting. It, to me, it's definitely a bipedal figure. So you're either yeah. looking at a human in a weird remote area um, that's probably naked, or you're looking at something, I don't know. And it didn't, uh, didn't, definitely didn't move like a bear. You know, bears do walk, you know, obviously on twos. <laughs> this thing was fluid and <laughs> fast, just doo doo. And you can make out the, the space between the legs as it crosses. And, and you got the cooler scenario. I, you know, I did look for impressions, but it was all rocky soil. You're not going to find any impressions of any animal out that area. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things you just put in the interesting box and you go, okay. And, you know, you had some guys, uh, some loggers that had sightings in that general area, possibly of a family unit. You have uh, these, these weird uh, nests in this area, uh, it, very close to this area. So you start paints a little bit of a picture uh, and, you know, unfortunately, it's just that. There's no, no proof. It's just interesting, but it keeps us going back to these areas. Sorry exactly. for the long yeah. answer. No, exactly. No, no. Always had you coming back for more. It's a teaser. It is a exactly. teaser, yeah, yeah. I wish yeah. it was five feet further back, and I, I would have known exactly what I was looking at, or a couple of feet, but it was so close. Um, I'm just thankful. Like it was washed out or whatever. I yeah, it just, it's white. It's just a, the flash was so close. So when, you know, it's an older camera too, but it took video and I got about 30 seconds and I got about <laughs> two seconds of it just two, two, you know, really quick. But it's, it's interesting. It really is. Yeah. That's a, that sounds awesome. Hey, hey, Shane, I got a question for you too. Now you're talking about these cameras set up and something goes and you don't know what the heck it is, but you just, you're, you're like, what was that? I remember you guys, the Olympic project had this one, this one uh, photo of something that was so close to the camera that it, it licked it and it was out of focus because it was so close and a flash went off. It was that night. And I want to say it was Reconics. Do you, it do was. you remember about that one? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, that, that was taken, that? but 
Yeah, that was taken before my time. Um, I still find it interesting. Once again, that one's interesting, but it's it's amb- it's it's ambiguous. You can't claim it any, yeah. e- either either way. Uh, I know uh, someone had a, and I don't know who the artist was, but they came through and, and gave their depiction of looking at it, what they you know we were seeing, and they kind of drew like a Sasquatch face. Um, yeah. But it, it, I still find it interesting. But you know, it's one of those again. It's just so ambiguous. It's it it could be, but it could be something else uh, because it was so close. But yeah, that was on a reconnaissance. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did, did you guys did it actually lick it? Did you guys actually get DNA off of that or or you, um, I, 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 on, uh, yeah, uh, honestly, I don't remember. I said um, I don't know if it actually licked it. I don't believe, and I could be wrong, so um, forgive me. I don't believe it yeah. licked the camera. Um, I believe it. I think originally it was behind the camera. So it messed with it, and then it got in front of the camera, and it was. Uh, I think maybe possibly a hand and then there was a, another one where there was a face of something um i know there was as far as i know no dna collected so i don't know if it, i don't believe it licked it but i could be wrong yeah i can't i'm just going my memory you know how that gets once you're over 50 you can't remember half the stuff yeah so i i, I that always fascinated me and i always go well i wonder if what would have happened with that i got an off the wall question for you too um do you remember um bob saget now he oh, yeah. showed up at your, at your the lake facility were you there when it was bobo's birthday and they gave him a sword no once again before my time and uh i've heard a lot of these stories and there was a lot that's of stuff that transpired when bob sag was up there a lot of funny stuff a lot of uh not so funny stuff um but i was not there i was um elsewhere i did not make that trip unfortunately okay uh yeah you guys would have to get uh derek on or um or Cliff, Cliff was there as well, and or Bobo. Uh, they could probably retell it. I don't want to speak for some of the nonsense that went on there <laughs> for certain parties. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it was a. Uh, uh, there was a lot of, a lot of fun stuff that went on that trip. Of course, Bob Saget being a comedian. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, I got to interview Bobo uh, this last. Uh, I think it was in April. We were over at, at Twin Lakes, and I, we're trying to do the podcast, but do it out in the field. So I, so in the field type stuff. Oh, we were awesome. on the fire and I was late at night and that came up and it was interesting to hear what he had to say about chopping things up with the samurai sword. And, and then, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, but maybe it's best you weren't there to experience that. <laughs> probably, probably. I think there was um, a few friendships ended that trip, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> oh, uh, I, I never made it. It's, I, I know uh, Bart was up there. He's a member of your guys group as well. I believe Bart Catino. Yeah, I mean yeah. he's he's one of those guys that gets out in the field. So he's he's um he's involved with us, but busy guy. Um, he's actually going to be up here. I'm going to be spending a week out with him this coming Monday. He's coming up to Washington doing his yearly pilgrimage up here, and we're going to get out in yeah. the field in the woods and and basically get no sleep because he's a therming fool, and I'm sure you guys know that he just therms, 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 <laughs> and we get out there and that's all we do. So uh, it'll be a, a week of no sleep. <laughs> oh yeah, well I, I've spent. A lot of quality time with, with, with Bart. A lot of quality time. I think I made it to Washington maybe four times uh, with up there. with Because I think one time we went up there, it was during the, uh, the, the Gimlin birthday thing. And we, we, we spent the night instead of with the hordes of people. We went out in the field near, I don't want to say the location because it might be sacred. But up one of these locations and we spent the night there and it was really awesome. We got to do some squatching while the conference thing was going on. And we also had a visit from Bob Gimlet came up and told stories around the fire, so that was pretty sweet. Was it a? It was it a lake. Um, at a lake. Oh well, not the same place where we spent. Well, I, I, several times I've been to the location where. Uh, yeah, that lake. Yeah, but yeah, okay. Th- th- this one, this was one that was outside of that. We were in the same geographic area, kind of near there. Gotcha. And I think the, the crowd was showing us a good time while we we're up there as well. So yeah, I enjoy my Washington visits. I just can't make enough of them. Yeah, well, and like right now I'm busy. I can't come up there. So I, I enjoy you know, my California visits, but I I'm in the same boat as you. <laughs> I think yeah. I beat you guys. I I uh, I have the distance troubling me. I'm in Iowa, and then I'll be in Florida. So it's going to be 
a gnarly um, drive just to make it to California, <laughs> let alone yeah. Washington. Oh yeah, I've done yeah. that similar <laughs> drives. It's uh, yeah, depends on what kind of time you have. If you have enough time, then it's worth the drive. If you're on a, a schedule, then it's it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> you almost have to take out like a bank loan just to drive that far yeah it's not cheap nope <laughs> yes, and not have, yeah not have relationships say so yeah that's gonna tie you down <laughs> i don't for well unfortunately i don't have a relationship so i'm good to go oh you have <laughs> a dog now uh, you, never mind you i was gonna say not to not not to be morbid but I'm going to miss that dog. She won't be around much longer, <laughs> sadly. Oh, okay. Yeah. But it's nice having a travel companion. No, she's good. Mm. Yeah. yeah, she doesn't She doesn't complain about the music I listen to. Not picky <laughs> about bathroom choices or food. So <laughs> the best travel companion <laughs> ever. Um, I, guess the next I, question, I guess the next question we, we, we want to ask Shane, uh, how about Monster X Radio? Yeah, I was exactly going to say that. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's been it's been a funky year, I and mean, we've been doing Monster X Radio since about 2013, and we have like a uh, a public uh, we have public shows, and we have kind of an exclusive private uh, shows, um, and a lot of those shows do make the public. Um, this year with COVID, uh, because of um, just a lot of different scenarios we've not pumped out as much shows as we usually do, but now we're starting to pick up steam again, get back to uh, at least a little bit of normalcy and uh, putting some shows out there. So, yeah, I mean, uh, we got uh, Julie wrench who does the Thomas Steenberg um, interviews, uh, which are, I, I love them and uh, Gunnar Monson and myself do a lot of the main uh, co-hosting of the shows. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of uh, it's a, it's a passion. It's something that, uh, you know, I never dreamed I'd ever do podcasting, never. But I wanted, when I, when I really started to move up to the Pacific Northwest, I really wanted, I wanted to learn more. And I thought, man, what an outreach. You can reach people, talk to other investigators. You can talk to people, witnesses. And uh, it's not, you know, podcasting is not about showboating yourself. I would rather just listen to my guests and all that stuff, you know. And, um, you know, and don't get me wrong. Sometimes Gunnar and I will talk about our work. We, we've been doing that lately, um, doing about what we've been doing in the field and, and stuff like that. But man, you get some great guests and you get some great um, eyewitnesses on there. And, and I always, it's like going to conferences, you know, podcasting gets bagged on sometimes. Uh, oh, it's the same old. And then you go to, you know, conferences, and all the conferences. But you know what? Every time I go to conference, and yeah, I do speak at them. Okay. Shoot me. Forgive me. Um <laughs> Uh, I always take, I, I always feel like I get more from the people that attend there than I give in, in just like podcasting in it's just, it's humbling. It's very cool because you're like, wow, you know, and if you don't go to, if you don't do podcasting or you don't listen to them, you don't hear about these encounters and you don't hear about what other people are doing, you know, around the country. Uh, and then if you don't go to these conferences, it's the same thing. You don't, man, I've seen some of the best trail cam photos and videos at conferences and if I never attended that, I never would have saw that. Or I learned about other areas where there's possible nests that if I didn't go there, I never would have talked to that, that first nations individual that had a, you know, this experience and saw that nest. And, and, and he's never talked to me before. He knows nothing about me, but he describes this nest and I'm like, wow, that's so, I mean, all this stuff, it's so worth it. Podcasting is, is phenomenal. I love doing it. It's a passion of mine as well as conferences, whether I'm speaking or just attending and uh, yeah, Monster X Radio, it's, it's, um, it's been a crazy, fun ride, and I don't see us going anywhere. We're going to keep plugging away, and um, man, yeah, so, and I hope you guys do the same, because I, I really do admire your podcast, and I like it. Keep doing it. Well, that, I don't, so Shane, uh, for, like, for us, I was like, I don't know who, I don't know if they've talked about it before I came along, but when I came along, I was like, I would love to do a podcast. Because with a podcast, you can do you can talk about so much that you're doing currently and you've done that you can't do with videos or pictures on social media. Was that kind of the reasoning behind what you guys or the reason you guys uh, started Monster X or what was the reason behind that? Yeah, main, the main reason was I just wanted to talk to people. I wanted to uh, have uh, witnesses on. I wanted to have other investigators on 
you know, um, to share their stuff, to give them a platform, you know, the eyewitness or the investigator, give them a platform to share whatever they have. And, oh, and, and quite honestly, also to share some of the stuff that the LM project is working on, or I'm working on, or, or my partners are working on, um, that maybe may make a spark or may, uh, bring someone else in. You know, uh, one of the greatest things I'm really proud of is that, um, with, and there's other shows out there, good ones. I, I can, I can think of quite a few of them, including, you know, Bigfoot Beyond, um, I love, I love the NOAC stuff. And, um, but one of the cool things is it's brought in a lot of academia and scientists and bio and people just curious. And, you know, we work, I, I work with project zoo book with Amy Boo and a fantastic group of people. And that's the same sort of kind of setup. You know, it's like you, you build it and they will come. Well, mm-hmm. if you keep everything grounded in a podcast or whatever venue you're in, you keep it grounded and, and you do your best to be, and some people hate this word, but I'm going to say it, citizen scientists, <laughs> um, do your best to keep it grounded and, and just be honest. Um, and, and if you're wrong, you're wrong. And all that's, man, I tell you, there's, there's individuals out there and they're coming. I've just seen like, I've never seen it before. I've been around for a little while. Um, they're, they're really interested and not just from, um, you know, like anthropologists or, or biologists. I mean, I'm seeing marine uh, biologists or entomologists, bug experts and but. And they're giving me great ideas and, and they're interested either they've had an encounter or they think it, there's a possibility or they can't understand why science is not at least giving this a look at because I mean, people are seeing something and they're experiencing something. So why wouldn't science be interested in just that phenomenon by itself? You know, they can poo poo on everything else. So, but I'm seeing a lot of people from all walks of science uh, and, and they're very non arrogant. They're very interested and I see kind of a, a movement and in, enforcing in, in this whole COVID thing really, I mean, you know, this whole pandemic really screwed up a lot of stuff this year, you know, not just with conferences and not just with certain stuff, you know, even with the Lent project, but even with contacts and, and trips made. And so, but hopefully, hopefully next year, after we get past a lot of, uh, you know, we get past, hopefully get past COVID elections and, and get, you know, people could, you know, turn each other's heads off and hating on each other. I'm uh, hoping we get back to that, uh, but man, it's uh, yeah. So monster X, that was another angle was to get uh, to make the subject matter as, as John Bindernagel would say, less taboo. And that's, you know, the late great John Bindernagel, someone I, I looked up to hugely um, before I ever met him. I just, I admired the guy and uh, you know, God, God rest his soul. Uh, just an amazing individual. And, and if I can just do a little bit of something with my podcast or my research or my investigations, just a little bit to honor him and show him that I, I, you know, he, all of his really profound, hard scientific work didn't go down the tubes. I can do a little bit of something just to uh, keep his memory alive and, 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 and people look at, towards him. They shouldn't be looking towards me. They should be looking towards people like John Bindernagel. If I can do something, I, then I, I've done my job and I'm happy with that. Yeah. I could have, I could have said it better myself, honestly. Best thing I could have, I wish I would have met. I wish I could have met John Bitternagel. Like he seems so well spoken and such a nice guy, and he knows his stuff. Absolutely. Like the guy yeah. is smart. Very humble. Very, very, just a, a giving, humble, amazing individual that was plucked too early, in my opinion. Just a yeah, just an amazing guy. And I, I got it. I was fortunate to get to know him very well, um, very well, and become friends and and uh you know i knew early on he what he was battling with um but yeah just an amazing guy i miss him so much and I, I'm, I'm not the only one there's tons of people i know you know dr jeff Meldrum misses him a ton they were they were very close and you know his lovely wife and so yeah yeah great guy very knowledgeable amazing amazing soul yeah no yeah. no doubt I, I, I got to meet him in yakima and he was really open and friendly and was willing to talk to the little guy. And I thought that was great. Exactly. And that's, that's what I am. It's just a little guy. And, and he, he, I remember I met him in, um, well, re-met him in Yakima um, roundup. I forget what year that was. And, and um, he, uh, you know, we, we, uh, there was a running joke. Every time we bump into each other, cause I bought him a beer way back years ago. And it's guy buy a beer and, and he's, oh, yeah, 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 buy it. Here, here, yeah, give me a beer. Yeah, that's great. And then we, we talked and we sat down and he goes, the next time we meet up, I'll buy you a beer. And so every time we meet up, we, he was usually busy. I was busy. He's, I owe you a beer, Shane. I owe you a beer. So uh, that was actually 
one of our last things. Uh, the last time I saw John was at the International Bigfoot Conference um, out in Kennewick. And, uh, you know, he was very frail and not, but he made that little joke again. And I said, I'm going to hold you to it, John. And fortunately, <laughs> I didn't see him again, but it was, it was our running joke. And it was, it was something I'll never forget. That's awesome. That's so cool to have someone like that with someone like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. God, that would that'd be so cool. And, and it's amazing to have a little ongoing joke with someone of that. Um, wh- what's the word? Um, caliber. Uh, just, caliber. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. In the field like that he was in. Well, as Robert said, you know, I mean, he actually would stop and talk to people and listen to them. And, you know, he's one of those guys like he wouldn't be looking around the room while you're talking. I'm like, okay, wait, you know, I've heard this. No, he would like look at you and really just take it in. You know, he'd listen to everything you said. And I just, that's one of those rare things nowadays where people are just looking for the next conversation or to leave, you know, and it's just rare breed of person nowadays. It's unfortunate, you know, and, but he was that, he yeah. did that. And that, you know, that's funny. Cause I can't, I can't remember who we were talking to. Kip and I had somebody, Kip and I had somebody on the podcast and we were talking about, Bob Gimlin and how you meet quote unquote celebrities in the Bigfoot world. And some of them are, can be kind of arrogant, you know, but I think it's undoubtable that Bob Gimlin is probably the most famous person in the Bigfoot community. One of the most famous and still to this day, he will give you his undivided attention no matter what. And he's happy to talk with you no matter who you are or what it is, you know, and that's admirable. Yeah. I was going to say John and, and Bob, John Bindernagel and, and Bob Gillen have something very much in common. The first time I met Bob, I think it was 2008 or 2009. And he asked my name. We met, we had a good chat and I hadn't seen, I didn't see Bob till the following year. And he remembered my name. He remembered my name. And we're talking like really prior to Facebook and all that. So it wasn't, you know, not that Bob was on there, but he remembered my name. John Binnernagel did the same thing. The memory, the retention and the detail of just trying to value somebody, remember them. Like, I don't know how I'm horrible. I admit I'm horrible. At it. <laughs> but John and Bob, man, they got memories like you wouldn't believe. And, and I've seen them do it with other people. I'm not special. I mean, other people, you know, uh, just the recollection, the memory, uh, someone's name they haven't seen in a year i just like what what that's just that was really cool and and, and i admire that and i think something nowadays we're so much into technology and stuff we we don't really we kind of throw all that subside oh your name what was his name again and her <laughs> name or and, and they you know they're not focused on the social media they're not focused on technology and all that you know they're focused on people you know no that's something we yeah, lost that's, no that's exactly it because they they grew up in a generation where you didn't have a cell phone. You could go on like social mm-hmm. media and look up anybody. They actually had to remember who that was. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, but regardless of the generation, I mean, they're still the most, I've never met John Bitternagel, but at least for Bob, I've met him a couple of times. He's the most nice, nicest person and caring person I've ever met in my life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Bob will tell you. Bob will tell you that same story over and over and over and over, like he's telling it for the first time. And that is quality and the attention there. And I sometimes I shake my head because I've known Bob for quite a while. I guess I first met him at, I'm going to say 2004 ish, the first BFR expedition. Anyhow, so he'd tell the same story over again and he'd be listening attentively. And it's like, how does he do that? How does he tell the same story over and over <laughs> and actually live the story? posture move his hands tell it like it's just happening so i really admire that that's he's a great storyteller was it 52 years 53 years since the film and he's been telling that story for hundreds of times a year more <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's that's an insane amount of times to recount a story <laughs> i don't care who you that are is. man <laughs> so okay tell Shane, smi- <laughs> yeah exactly. yeah well, he does it genuinely too. It's not like, yeah. I'm saying some of us might tell a story and put on a smile for show, but when he tells it, he's genuine about it, which that's, 
even more incredible to me and just mm-hmm. proves like, it makes me believe that the film is more real which shane leads me to my next question what is your opinion on the patterson gimlin film do you think it's real do you think it's possibly it could be real or a man in a costume oh, i mean my my personal opinion is it's legit that's just my personal opinion i think it's legit um you know, uh, absolutely. I think it's 100% authentic. Um, yeah, that's it. And, you know, and uh, one of the questions that gets asked sometimes is, well, if it was fake, ooh, is that, you know, ruin your paradigm? Far from it. I mean, I, there's, for me, Sasquatch, there are Sasquatch out there. There's no doubt about that in my brain. I don't, I won't claim to know what they are or what the heck they do. You know, I got my ideas and all that stuff, but, oh, uh, I think that film is legit. And, if it was ever proven to be a hoax, um, it wouldn't. Uh, yeah, I'd be dismayed, sure, but it wouldn't. No, I mean, it wouldn't even bother me. It really wouldn't. But oh, yeah, it's it's. I don't. I'm, that's not going to happen. It's for me. It's one hundred percent authentic, legit uh, Sasquatch. And you, uh, Robert, you mentioned earlier Scorpion Creek. You know, yeah. uh, a lot of people. A lot of people. Well, you guys may be familiar with this, and I've spoke about it at conferences and, and maybe a podcast. Too, I don't remember. Um, but there, you know, you know, Daniel Perez, uh, the Bigfoot newsletter, he interviewed Lyle Lafferty, right? Who found a nest, uh, an odd nest above Scorpion Creek that feeds into Bluff Creek. It, <clears throat> pardon me, in 1967. So is there a connection there? Who knows? I mean, there could be. Um, yeah. I just, I found that very odd. And it was found by, once again, a timber surveyor cruiser, uh, you know, somebody involved with the forestry. So, that, you know, it just adds more validity to the story to me. And maybe there's a connection there. Maybe there's nothing to do with that. I don't know. But I, I, I think that's that, fascinating. Yeah, that's funny that you say that. Because what, Robert? Scorpion Creek's like a mile up Yeah, Scorp- the creek? Scorpion Creek. It's the a whole side? mile up. The- and then once past Scorpion, like this last, uh, what month is it? August, last July, we even hiked, we actually hiked two miles up from the film site. One mile to Scorpion Creek where we spend the night, couple nights. And then we moved farther up the watershed where the North Fork and the South and the Main Fork meet. And that was pretty interesting area there in the canyon, but it's still pretty wild. We found elk tracks along the oh. way up that way. Oh, right on. And, yeah, and I've seen elk once before off the go road by mile marker nine a few years back crossing. I'd do a double take because it was by itself. I go, that deer's awfully big. Wait a minute. It's not a deer. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, but got Scorpion Creek. That was one of our goals to get up there and spend a couple of nights to see what's up there. And it was, you know, one thing I'm nice about Scorpion Creek, it's really wide and there's no vegetation growing on the big sandbar. And at the uh, upstream end, there's a long straightaway. Sound familiar? Like the bowling alley. Yeah. So then there's a big... (laughs) Then there's a big bend in it, like right on the downstream side, like to Hinden's X. You know, it's like the similarities there were so, it's not as big, but the similarities were there. I, I, I can envision it, you know, like if you wanted to redo the film, that's where you'd have to go. And I think you can even at, land a helicopter in there wow. because it's open and it's big enough to do that. And great swim holes, pretty open. Some logs are out there, some debris. It doesn't have the big trees though, but it's, it was pretty right. nice getting up there. But that's a wild place. Yeah, I believe uh, you guys posted some videos on that. I got to see, and it was really, I mean, I was like, wow, I really like those videos. Uh, I think you guys camped in Scorpion Creek or it, down in the, the yeah. river basin. Or, yeah, I, I, I can't remember where I saw those videos. Maybe it was on social media, or, but uh, that was a, uh, Tate, were you there as well? I can't remember who videoed that, but. Uh, uh, Rowdy, Rowdy filmed all that stuff. Okay. Um, I was actually up Good stuff. above the film site with Jamie Wayne. Okay. Yeah, we good were the, stuff. I really enjoyed that. We were the main base camp. I wanted to go, but I had my cousin and my dog with me, and that would have been a whole hassle to hike a tent with them down <laughs> all through that bushwhacking and stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, unfortunately, Roddy I didn't Kelly get to go. Yeah, Roddy Kelly did most of the video work. He brought his drone, too, so we launched the drone from Scorpion. And wow. being at the bottom of the and you, you got to keep it in sight because if, if you get too far away, it breaks radio contact and then you'll lose your craft, right? Mm. So uh, when you're flying over the top of the canyon, you could stay in contact with it. But when you're in the bottom of the canyon and we launched it from Scorpion, we got to keep an eye on it because we actually did a, a podcast version out in the field and we we're recording it as we were launching it and talking back and forth. There's a couple of points there when Ruddy goes, 
wait a minute, I, I can't, I, I have to focus right now. It, it starts beeping and it says, oh, you, like, you just lost your drawing. You got to wait for it to come back. <laughs> oh, it's back. It's like, because Roddy lost a drone a few years back flying over the film site and it didn't have the return button, right? And it, and it has a GPS, but with the GPS, it's jerky, so you don't get a clear shot. So he disconnects the GPS, get a smooth video. So you've got a GoPro attached to it. So he's flying, the thing's beeping, saying, hey, you better come back. He goes, oh, one more run, I can do this. And then it just lost, <laughs> lost it. Oh. And the trees around the film site with, that, so, with the GoPro camera. Wow. <laughs> I, so, uh... <laughs> anybody visiting the uh, Patterson Gilman film site, if you – are daring enough to find a drone with a GoPro on it. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, the GoPro was in, was in good shape. Dang. It was in good, yeah. good shape. Who knows? I, I feel for him. I've lost stuff, and, man, it's you're like, ugh, it's yeah. a punch to the gut. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it's, sh- oh, go ahead. Sorry, Robert. Well, I, I want to ask some, some little bit of personal questions because, uh, like, I want to ask Shane, how long has he been squatching? And, and why did you get into squatching? Of all those crazy things you can do, why squatching? <laughs> you, can, you can get into drugs or alcohol, but you get into squatching. <laughs> well, for some people, they rank them all the same. So, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I grew up in Scotland and I moved over to the States in 93. Uh, but while I was in Scotland, I was very heavily invested in paleontology, uh, Loch Ness Monster, Yeti, and Bigfoot too was but Bigfoot was so far away as the Yeti. Um, I was very interested in cryptids and dinosaurs. And so uh, my mom would buy me books and, and get me, you know, um, replicas of dinosaurs and stuff. And I, I started collecting and reading and reading. And uh, fortunately, you know, my mom's American, my dad's Scottish. And so we, we relocated to the States, San Diego. And when I got to San Diego in 93, um, I started uh, getting more involved in just reading about it and, and like who I'm on, I'm in the States now in the Sasquatch here on, um, at least on the West coast, but similar West, I, you know, I thought if there's a chance it'd be up there based on the Patterson film and everything else. And, you know, um, I, I, as I got older and finally got my wheels, I started going up to uh, places like San Bernardino, Palmer mountain, you know, Cuyamaca, uh, Laguna area, you know, you got the zoobies down there in the East, East County, the old Zubies report. Um, and um, there was other reports, you know, in Power Mountain. Uh, there's a lot of reservations out there, and you got the stick man. I, I used to do a lot of work in Joss Tree National Park. Uh, one of my main places I would love to go, so quite a drive, was Yosemite. I spent a lot of time in Yosemite. Uh, in, in Bishop, you name it. I've been up and down California. And uh, to be honest with you, I never, um, until, uh, so I moved to Oregon in 2008, uh, met my wife and moved up to Oregon. Um, I, I never found anything of interest in California and, and just ba- mainly because I don't think I knew what I was looking for. And not that I do now, don't get me wrong, but you know, you know, you think, Oh, you go out of the woods and you do this and that. And, and I was way off. Um, yeah. I you find bear tracks and all that stuff, but you know, I thought I was conducting research. The only thing I really managed in California was talk to a lot of cool witnesses. I thought that was really neat. And um, 2008, I moved up to Oregon. I thought, here we go. Bam. This is amazing country. It's a lot like Northern California, but different. A lot, a lot of big trees and bass forts and high mountain lakes and rivers. And I was in heaven. I mean, I lo- I'm a fisherman. I love to fish. So I combine sas- you know, my stuff, my research investigations, a lot of times with fishing and you know, camping, hiking. Um, so from 2008, I was going out to different places. Once again, wasn't finding anything. Um, I found maybe a couple interesting, I would call interesting impressions that I couldn't quite explain. Uh, but I'm not a, an expert in that field. So I always just kind of, you know, and I really, back then, I still, I didn't really cast a whole lot. I should have, but um, so uh, 2011, uh, I'm with some coworkers up, uh, but uh, we decided to go high mountain uh, fishing in some up in the Mount Hood area, the wilderness. And I uh, was into Sasquatch definitely, but this was a fishing trip. Uh, my buddies weren't really into Sasquatch. One of them maybe had a sighting, the other guy's from Boston. He's not a camper. Uh, he had really no business being in the woods. And um, I had an encounter and that solidified the existence. I, but what really just got me into it was just this, you know, the, the mystery of it all, the, the mystery of, you know, could, could it exist is the, you know, the, is the Patterson film real? Um, you know, I grew up on like a lot of people watching, 
you know, different programs and TV things and reading different stuff. And so I just thought, man, what a mystery, um, you know, why not be involved in this? You know, there's a lot uh, we know and there's a lot we don't know. And I still to this day, I don't think I know much, but uh, man, it's, it gets me in the woods. And so um, gets me around some, I met a lot of amazing people, you know, to, it's funny. I think about this all the time growing up in Scotland and reading about Bob Gimlin and, and Roger Patterson and, and, you know, reading books and, and hearing about, you know, Dr. Meldrum and uh, Derek Rand, all these guys, all these, Bob, you name it. And to actually, and, and Cliff Ehrickman and all this, and now to call them friends or, and to know them at least, <laughs> and to be in their presence. And it's just like, how did I go from Scotland to San Diego to Oregon to Washington? <laughs> and trust me, none of this was on purpose. It just, I happened to be in Portland and I met Derek Randalls and I met Cliff and um, it just, it just, it's so funny how life works. I, I still every day, you know, I'm like, man, I'm blessed. And just, it's just so weird. Mind boggling how life works and people you meet. And now those people you, that you're on a different, different side of the world, you know, well now, and, and many of you call friends and, and many of you call brothers and, and uh, you get to do this, this really fun endeavor together and share stories and share stuff and get out in the woods. I mean, it's mind boggling to me. I still can't get over it all the time. I, I'm not sure how it happened, but it happened. So um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I, I hope I answered that question. <laughs> no, hey, Shane, when you, hey, so when you were, uh, <laughs> no, sorry. Uh, Shane, like when you were saying like, when you meet all these people, you know, when you're like, read about it and you're like, Oh, this person, that person. And it's crazy to call them friends. Now I feel exactly like that. Cause I'm definitely more new to this than you guys are, you know, I'm only 27 and I got into squatching in California within the past few years. And it's like, I met the bluff Creek guys. I met you. I'm friends with Bobo and Cliff and Matt. And I was like, I never thought I would know crazy, all these yeah. people that are pretty well known in the community. Mm -hmm. But now I can call you guys friends. And it's like, it's the Bigfoot community is so small that it's actually possible to do that and make connections like that. And it's pretty cool because you, Shane and Robert and Cliff and Matt and Bobo have actually helped me out through my endeavors of, looking for Bigfoot. And for that, I'm grateful to everybody and you. Well, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate it. And, and likewise, you know, it's um, nobody's better than anybody else. Um, I admire people like you and, and definitely Robert. Um, you know, I'm one of those guys that I, 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 I don't always comment and I don't, but I'm watching and I, I and I admire what people do and what they've done. And, you know, it's like, uh, I learned so much from different people, you know, uh, academic and non-academic individuals. Mm -hmm learned so much and I, I just I'm like wow they're doing really neat stuff doing really neat stuff and, and they're going about the right way of thinking they got a level head and they're just generally nice people that's kind of who I surround myself with it's just generally nice people that no egos uh that are um, you know in it for the right reasons and um you know that's who I surround myself with and I've been fortunate that way that I am surrounded by just I mean within the you know just the Olympic project itself amazing group of people I mean just really good-hearted give your shirt off their back sort of, and um, no ego, no, no non-egotistical uh, solid individuals. And then outside of that, of course, same scenario, you know? Uh, and yeah, I, I learned so much from other people and it just, it's great to call a lot of people friends or sisters or brothers. And um, yeah. So yeah. What a cool ride. What a, I mean, what, just what a fun endeavor with a lot of really neat people. And, you know what? A lot of people are doing big things, I think, and they're getting places, you know, it's, um, it's a, it really is, even though it's a team effort, even outside of our, our, our groups, it, you know, collectively, it's, it's a bit of a team effort, especially with the data, you know, the data stuff. So yeah, upwards and onwards. Exactly. Exactly. Sorry, sorry to cut you off, uh, Robert. I was, I wanted to go on to what Shane was saying earlier. Oh, no problem. I thought you had to go to the bathroom again, but we're good. <laughs> no, I'm good. Hey, so Shane, I, I got, I, sometimes I like to ask personal questions because when I'm out in the woods and I spend a lot of time, some of that's by myself and things happen to me and some things I can't explain. Some things I wish there were other people there when it happened. So I have a witness or sometimes I get the crap scared out of me and I wish there was other people there mm -hmm. to make it less frightful. 
what experience have you had out in the woods that just basically put you on edge and made you question why you're even out there doing the first place? Yeah, I mean, my encounter in 2011, it wasn't um, a Bigfoot trip. And so I can't say that question. Uh, what, later on, when I went back to the area, many weeks, I, nothing happened, but we would visit adjacent lakes. My, my buddy that was there for the, one of the guys that was there for the original encounter, we go back into this area. And, um, and I'm not tying this together, but there's a missing individual out there. And I thought, well, shoot, you know, he did go missing under weird circumstances, but you know, you're in the woods, a lot of weird stuff happens. And, and, and a lot of it is mostly, a lot of it's explainable. Um, but I thought, you know, we do a lot of off trail hiking and we're out here, you know, trying to um, revisit what transpired and, and maybe get the same sort of thing to happen again, maybe come across impressions or get a sighting again or whatever. And, and maybe we'll come across this guy's body, you know, out there, uh, you know, he was well searched for. I thought, well, we'll just go somewhere where we don't think they searched. Um, and so we would go to this particular lake, <clears throat> pardon me, that was about a mile away from where we had our encounter where this particular guy was camped and went missing from. And I remember we were out in this lake and it's about three o'clock in the afternoon and we're fishing. Like I said, I combine this stuff together. I'm going to fish. If there's a lake or a body of water, you know, it's hard for me not to want to toss a line in it, you know? So we're up there fishing. He's on one, and these are small mountain lakes, Mount Hood. So he's fishing on one side of the lake. I'm fishing on the other. And we have walkies and he's gone here. I'm hearing grunting off to my right. I'm thinking, oh, you know what? There, there, I know there's a large bear up in this area. I've seen it. And I'm like, it's probably a bear. You know, just, just keep your wits about you. Watch out. And then he's like, it's getting closer. And so I'm listening and he decides he wants to come back around and meet me. He's done. He's, you know, in an, we start hearing these odd whistles. And it's three o'clock in the afternoon, sunny, no breeze, nothing. We start hearing these odd whistles, and they're come. I hear them from behind me. He's hearing them on his side of the lake, and then we get this weird percussive sound. It sounds like a knock, and I'm like, "Huh, hmm." So, and he's coming back around the lake. <clears throat> he meets back up with me, and there's a huge, huge rock snag or a slag come down the side of this mountain, and there's bushes kind of going up the side there. And we're back there and he's with me looking at across the lake to see if he could, we could see whatever he was hearing grunt and maybe it'll pop out. And we see this bush up on this, this rock side, just shaking like crazy. And I'm like, what in the world is that? I mean, did, how did, we didn't see anything enter it. Uh, you know, maybe there, you know, we're thinking maybe a bear or something, you know, so our we're, we're eyes are fixed on that. And we start hearing these odd whistles again. And, but the whistles coming up from that rock snag area and there's something behind us. And then it gets stops. We're, we're a little weirded out. It's just odd. We've been up there a bunch of times, never experienced anything like that in that particular lake. And then I hear a crack. And then, shh, boom. And it came back from the direction of our tent. We had our tent set up. And we knew what it was. It was a tree. A tree had fallen over. And we're like, this is getting kind of weird. This is getting very weird. Three o'clock in the afternoon, sunny, beautiful day, no wind. And you're getting all this stuff happening. He's freaking out because he's like, he wanted to get involved in research and all that stuff. And he's just like, yeah, let's go back and check. Because it came, that sound, that tree came from back towards our tent. So we start hiking down this little uh, game trail back to our tent. And I, uh, we come across this tree. And it's a dead tree. It's a, not like it's a live tree. But it's right across the trail. And it's 30 feet from our tent. And he's like, I'm, I'm out of here done and i'm like well it's you know we got we got a two-hour hike out and it's gonna get dark in about two hours and you really want to go back now we have to pack up and he's yes i'm done so i'm like and we don't have any cell phone reception in this area so i'm like i'm gonna call my wife but i had to wait till we hiked out and then get on this gravel road and drive five miles out just to get reception and get back on the main highway so yeah i mean we saw this we looked at this tree that you know it, uh, I can't say it was pushed over, you know, it was dead, but at the base of it, it was all smashed. It looked like something big had been behind this and it's 30, I mean, across the game trail, right. I mean, 30 feet from our tent. It was just really odd. And the whistles and the grunts. And I thought, man, what am I doing? That's, that's one of those moments. What am I doing? There's a missing guy out here. You know, we're about, we're less than, we're less than a mile from where we had our, our original counter. And every time we come out, not every time, but, when we have something happen, it always seems um, like we're not welcome or wanted out. And I'm not saying that with Sasquatch. 
but it was weird. It was definitely weird. And my buddy has never been back out there since I do. I'm up in Washington. That was in Oregon. I do pilgrimages. Like I'm going to be, I'm going to spend a couple of days with Bart next week. And then I'm going to head up to, to uh, this particular area in Mount hood and, and spend a couple of days there. But that was one of those scenarios. I've had a couple, but that was, that was a memorable one. Cause I had somebody with me, Robert, you know, uh, there, there's times when you're out there and you don't have somebody with you and you, you, you wish they were to not only experience it, but uh, you know, that little bit of, it's, it's a mental thing. It's like a safety factor. And um, you know, we're, you know, a lot of us are crazy. We, we do a lot of solo stuff and, and uh, yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> so it, yeah. <laughs> well, yes. a, we probably have a buddy in the woods if we can get one, but sometimes we're just strong and we go. We, we yeah. If we hear the call, we go. The call then of the wild go, and we go. Oh. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, I, I, I'm kind of like your friend, Shane. I'm, it's like, it's something scary that happens. You don't, <laughs> you're just like, I'm done. <laughs> so there's a couple of people on the Bluff Creek project. I'm not going to say any names, but I'll admit that I'm one of them that <laughs> I am timid by the dark and what's out there. And I don't want to be out there alone, really. <laughs> Even if something freaky happens, it is intimidating. So I'm just saying. It, regardless of what it is, it could be a known, it could be a known, you know, uh, you know, it's, you, you be, and I'm sure you have, you have a bear come up and nudge your tent or come through your camp at night or grunt or bark or, you know, anything like that. Yeah, it's scary it's, it's it's kind of freaky you know i mean i've been charged at and all sorts of stuff and yeah but you know the more you do the more confident you are and and if you look at if you're really smart about stuff you know i mean having someone there with you is by far being sm smarter than going solo yeah but you know what i don't i don't live life that way many people don't live that life that way it, the more you do it the more confident you are and and you and you look at the numbers and you don't do anything stupid right you know you don't go if you got a set plan, you stick to that plan. You don't, because if you go off trail and you don't really stick to that plan, people know where you're at. That's, that's, you're, 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 you know, you're asking for it. A lot well, of things like, can happen. You can get, uh, you get stung. You can walk on a beehive or hit a beehive or a wasp nest, get stung 20 times and die way off trail or yeah. fall off a cliff or fall in a hole or get attacked by an animal or you have a heart, you name it. And uh, so you stick to kind of a game plan, but it, be smart, man. but you know, nothing to be afraid of in the dark. I, I mean, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been weirded out plenty of times. I'm not like some bad man pajama, uh, but you know, you get, you get, you get more competent the more you do just like anything else in life. Well, it's like yeah. a good analogy I think is like, if you're learning to ride a bike or learning to drive a car or learning to do anything new, don't try and test your limits beyond what you know you can do. Absolutely. Cause if you do, if you test your limits, that's when you get, that's when you're going to get hurt or get scared of doing that thing. And like the same is with big footing. If you're afraid of the dark, cause a lot of things happen at night. If you're afraid of the dark, take it easy. People with you don't go off a like a trail that you don't know or anything. Mm -hmm. And just like you said, just be smart about everything that you're doing right and then you know because otherwise you're just going to get hurt or killed or yeah i mean and you're just less competent and, and if you it's dark you know i mean it's natural for people to be afraid of the dark and you know and you hear a bump in the woods or something at night then you know if you're you got to be competent you got to be absolute and if you go out of the woods and you got you already got the thoughts of the boogeyman being out there and all then then everything that happens you're gonna think it's the boogeyman or sasquatch or whatever you know and and I mean, just recently, I did a, a a backpacking trip up to an area in Packwood, Washington, and I swore I heard, heard a whoop, I, and so did a couple others, like a really solid whoop. Um, we we reviewed, uh, we had we had recorded multiple recorders, but we went out and investigated the area and um, and looked at it on Sonic Visualizer. Actually, looking at it, it ended up being a tree. It was the weirdest thing. So we call it the the whooping tree. It was a tree <laughs> that would pop up. But it sounded like a classic whoop. I mean, like what people would associate with Sasquatch. And it was a tree. It was a tree. And we, it, it, you know, and we got it recorded multiple times and we got the Hertz level and all that. And, um, but if, if, and this was, you know, at night and, and during the day, but if we didn't go out and investigate it and we thought, oh, that's got to be a Sasquatch, you know, then you leave that down and you replay, you played that recording on, um, on a show or, or for the public. Oh, you got a, you got a whoop. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> 
I, I want to play down. I'm going to play on Monster X. Cause it, it sounds like a whoop, but it's not. It's a tree. And we found the tree and we were just like, we were totally bewildered how, how that tree made that sound. But, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. No, that's exa- it's so funny that you say that because, like, I try not to be the kind of person that's like, oh, that's a Sasquatch right away. Because um, I was with a group. Robert, I think you were there, but you weren't there the very last night. We were at okay. Twin Lakes where you guys have cameras set up. And I did a wood knock. And it's like our camp is right by the lake. And it echoed really loud. And right after I did the knock, there was a knock back. And so Robert, and it makes sense too, because when you make the sound, when you hit a now, uh, the, when you do a wood knock, the sound could shake something loose like an acorn. Mm-hmm. And the acorn could have fallen on a dead tree. Mm-hmm. And to me, that makes perfect sense. So, do I think it was a Bigfoot when I did that? No. Most likely, it was what Robert said, an acorn. And that's what I think what, what's happened. I did it, and it shook something loose, and it fell down. It's funny you mentioned the acorn thing, not to derail the conversation. But I was in Kentucky one time in an area that was recommended. I was just uh, traveling through, and I said I contacted an investigator. And um, he said, oh, you could go out to this area. And went out there, and I was like, well, this is really neat. And I could fish. So it was even better. Um, but I heard, was hearing what I thought was some sort of – percussive sound like a knock and and uh the next morning I got up and it was acorn like a little squirrel would knock off and it would just sound like a perfect knock the way the woods were set up in the echo but it was acorn yeah, and, uh, yeah so it's one of the things you gotta investigate now when it comes to knocking yeah, there's no doubt in my head sasquatch does that why it doesn't i don't know but i tend to think spe- specifically up here in the pacific northwest because uh, a lot of our stuff's in oh, north california a lot of times um certain parts it, everything's wet you go to mount hood national forest for you know certain times it's nine months out of the year everything's wet and you go to grab a limb and hit it against a tree it's going to shatter it's going to you know it's, and um i think sasquatch really you know i think it utilizes rocks not not as tools per se you know not chip but the, you hit a you hit a rock against a tree you can do that multiple times and i always refer back to my encounter with where we had five solid i mean five solid repetitive knocks where we could feel them in our tents on the ground, you know, just, it was so powerful. And then the rock came into camp right there mere seconds afterwards. And I, well, I didn't connect the dots there. It was much later when I'm like, and I thought, well, shoot, you know, you hit a tree with a rock, you can do it multiple times and you could make that noise and I've done it. And then throw a rock. You could, so rocks are universal and up in the summer West to find, you can find limbs. Sure. You know, but a rock, there are plentiful amount of rocks, and, and they, they can make a really cool percussive sound against a tree. And that's funny. That Also, that's funny that you say that, too, going back and forth on the funny. Because um, when I was up there um, on a – I think it was around the 50th anniversary, me and my dad and a couple other friends that we – they were on the podcast last week. We were up there – Robert, I think you were there with Rowdy and Daniel Perez, and it was snowing that night. No, I, no, I wasn't there when it was snowing. Sorry. Okay, so, I, so it was. I know. Oh, it was Daniel Kip and Rowdy that were there at the, they were at the film site area, and then yeah, me and, then, and Terry, then, yeah. me Terry I, and Stevie and my dad were doing squatching on the goat road, and it was raining. It's been raining that night and snowing. And we were doing knocks, and we heard a knock back. And now, like Shane said, everything is so wet up there. You know, when everything is snowing and raining up there, it's really wet. So what could have made a knock that night when we heard one? It's- well, I, I, I have an explanation for you. I, I, as you know, I spent a lot of time outdoors. I've had, on two occasions, uh, which sounded like a knock, very loud, which I think was one of the larger trees. The trees have a crack that runs down the center of the tree. And when the tree moved back and forth, it'll make a popping sound that sounds like a loud knock from time to time. So that, I've experienced that before. I wonder, it just makes me wonder sometimes, like if I didn't do a knock, would I've heard that knock? Coincidental. S- you never coincidental. know. It's just like one of those things, like, man, if I didn't do that knock, would it have happened? You know, well, at that did time you when I was there, knock? 
Did you see what Knox? That's the thing. That's the that's the one thing I don't like about Knox is because yeah. you have to see it to know what made it. Right, and and I was going to mention too. I mean, nowadays you, I mean, depending on where you go, you know, uh, nowadays knocking, you know, has become, uh, um, you know, obviously familiar with Sasquatch, you know, with with the general public. So if you knock and and uh, depending on where you're at, you know, I've had it happen to me. You knock and someone knocks, you know, a quarter mile away or whatever, a couple hundred yards away. You're like, oh, I got a response. It ends up being a person. Um, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I really, I don't do knocking. And I, unless it's like, you know, I'm on a week long trip or a couple day trip and it's the last day, I got nothing to lose. <laughs> I'll maybe, <laughs> I'll maybe do a knock or a yell, but you know what I've found over the years, uh, at least my opinion, this is my opinion is I just act like a camper, you know, when I, and, and you know, uh, what's the word of, people use um, camping with a purpose or whatever. Uh, or oh, yeah. so I mean, natural. <laughs> just natural. You know, if you're chopping wood, you're out there chopping wood. That sounds like a knock. Um, you're out there yeah. cooking. You're out there. You're, uh, you know, like when I'm out there, I never do for the almost never likes, unless it's like the last thing I got nothing to lose. I never do what people would surprise as Bigfoot calls. I used to, don't get me wrong. I used to, now I do like, I'll call my buddy, but like, Hey, Mitch, you know, I yell human or, Hey, I do human, you know, um, just to maybe attract something in that area, you know, uh, let them know I'm here, but I'm a human. I don't try to, I don't really try to mimic Sasquatch if that's even a thing. Um, so you, you do more like the non, not just camper, non evasive, non evasive approach. You're like, I'm a human and I'm out here. What's up? Yeah, I just, you know, I mean, I, what I, my favorite thing to do is get off trail. I love getting off trail and hiking and making myself known in those areas. I go, I'd like to go where your average hiker or whatever doesn't go. Everybody usually, most humans stick to trails. That's just human nature. And I don't blame for not getting, I like to get off trail, get up on ridge lines, circle, make myself known. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll urinate, uh, you know, cause I have to, <laughs> yeah. but I mean, I, I basically <laughs> leave a, a trail back to my camp. Um, and I make myself like, kind of unpredictable like what what is yahoo doing up here in this way off trail (laughs) nobody comes here and uh and i i I once again face that off of past experiences where i've had some odd stuff occur uh, that i think kind of plays and you know ties in so that's that's my approach but don't get me wrong every once in a while i'll do a knock or a yell um for me doesn't do any harm especially on the last day of the trip and you've had nothing happen just you know pull out all the stops (laughs) no like i I agree with that. And you know what I've done is I, well, Robert said this one time to me, he, Robert Robert's said, smart guy. Robert, well, I don't know if he yes. has the same, I don't know if he agrees with the same now, but he's like, I like to do knocks first because if it's like, and I can't remember who said this, or I don't know if I watched it on finding Bigfoot or something, but when you do a call of any animal, it's almost like speaking a foreign language. Like if you're American, you speak Spanish <laughs> to somebody, they're going to know you don't speak Spanish. <laughs> so <point>. a knock <laughs> is kind of like for when you're doing Bigfooting, a knock is like, it's either a human or a Bigfoot that's doing a knock. That's going to, it's, it's either one or the other. And yeah. it's, you don't even know. <laughs> but when you're doing a Bigfoot call, and Bigfoot's going to pick up on that, whether it's going to know if it's another Bigfoot or another human. So I like doing the knocks first, getting those out of the way. And if that doesn't work, then I'll try the calls later. Yeah. As like a yeah. last resort. I, I just like it when, you know, I, I really, I try to make my base camp the focal point, you know, cause I don't think I'm going to go out hiking and, you know, necessarily, you know, maybe a river or Creek somewhere like that's probably your best chance. Um, because of the noise and everything we talked about earlier, but I think your best chance is just getting out there, making yourself known and, and staying in one location for a lengthy period of time. You know, unfortunately I'd like to do it longer. I can't, you know, we got lives, families and all that. Staying in one spot for a lengthy period of time, but getting off trail and, and making yourself known and maybe something will come check you out. Just maybe it's, it's happened before. I've taken many uh, reports over the years that like that. And I go back to past experiences and, that's just my approach. I make myself the focal point. Um, I have my equipment at base and, uh, you know, and uh, wait and see something come check you out. Something maybe will push you out or something, you know, all that stuff, you know, 
that uh, a lot of people wish for and a lot of people uh, don't wish for. I think that's, that's the key right there, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> Shane, I got a question. Because I know when I go out squatching, like on my way to the destination, like if I'm going to California, if I'm just going locally, on my drive there, I'll play some music to kind of get me pumped up more than I already am. What's the kind of music that you like to listen to to kind of get yourself in that mood? Like, yeah, I'm ready for it. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, just generally speaking, music wise, you know, I'm a yeah, bagpipes. I love the bagpipes. So I, I, uh, I just love listening to bagpipes. It could be any, anything bagpipe related. I got tons of family members that play bagpipes. I love, um, uh, run rig. It's a Scottish band run rig. Got a lot of good stuff. I'm a big country fan. I'm a big rock fan. Um, I'm, I'm a Pavarotti fan. I like, you know, uh, the tenor Pavarotti. So cross, I'm across the board. I like good music, but you know, as soon as I step in the woods, uh, you know, whether I'm driving to a spot and I step in the woods, I, I, music's done. Um, I just, I love, <laughs> I love the peaceful, the serenity, you know, and my wife laughs at me because I sleep. So I'm just, I don't know why, but I sleep really good in the woods and uh, better than I do at home. No joke. And I, I I used to sleep with no pad. You're just right on the ground. You're like, Ur. but I liked it. And, but, you know, you just get older and things start to creak. And ooh, I need, that, that's really <laughs> cold. Yeah, see, I got a pad and I just I sleep amazing in the woods. And I just love, you, you know, the, the noise of the woods, the wind, the rain, you know, all that stuff. And that's my music when I'm out, you know, they're just listening to all that stuff. But yeah, I mean, I'm across the board when it comes to listening to music, even on the drive, you know, it could be something from from scotland you know like pipes or run rig or like country rock and roll or or even Pavarotti. you know i love nesson dorma that's one of my favorites by him and it's uh not by him but he's sung and uh so yeah i'm across the board man uh, it doesn't take me much doesn't take much for me to get you know excited and pumped up uh, i know i'm going to the woods you know which yeah. is I'm, I'm fortunate i live in the woods and i get to go out all the time so but it just puts a smile on my face. <laughs> I'm like, I always go with that expectation. I'm not going to have anything happen. Yeah. But I listen to my favorite band and that gets me more pumped up and then not having an expectation of anything happening gets me pumped up. Yeah. Cause that's when generally <laughs> things happen <laughs> for some weird reason. I don't know. It just happens that way. Exactly. And that, that's kind of a fact, unfortunately. <laughs> it, it really is. You almost have to tell yourself nothing is going to, well, like, okay, so I ride dirt bikes off and on. My dad's uncle was a professional racer, and he taught my dad, and my dad taught us. And my dad would get so mad. I was like, don't get hurt. He's like, don't say that because it's in my head. <laughs> it's, it's like if you tell yourself I'm going to get hurt riding dirt bikes, you're going to get hurt. But if you tell yourself big footing, I'm not going to have anything, something happens for some weird reason. It's like the yeah. opposite. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I I never, I really never expect anything to happen. And, and most times nothing, I mean, almost all the time, nothing happens, but when something does happen and you've been going to that area frequently it, it, that it stands out so much you're like that is irregular. I have to pursue that and, and get to an answer. That is just as exciting as anything else. Cause you, you know, whether you come to a conclusion that, okay, I figured it out. And like I was talking about that, 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 that whoop, you know, that's something I can put in poor portfolio and go, okay, well, I know what that was. You know, I thought it was this and I was wrong, but now I know yeah. it's that. So it's, it's just a, there's endless mysteries uh, besides Sasquatch. Same with just no nature and, and sounds. I mean, that, that is exciting stuff. I mean, really. So every time you step in the woods, you just never know what you're going to experience, but chances are it probably won't be anything to do with Sasquatch. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true right there. Um, so, okay, guys, we're about like on an hour and a half, give or take. Um, yeah, Tate, I don't, I don't mean to be rude, too. Um, I, I, I can spend a little bit more time, but I do have to peel out here shortly. If no, that's okay. I was going no, okay. to say that. I was going to say any, uh, any last uh, advice you'd give to anybody trying to get into the field of Bigfooting? Um, my only advice would be just, you know, I'm, I've been taught this by Derek Randalls and many other individuals. Just enjoy, first of all, enjoy uh, your surroundings, enjoy the nature, get to know if you're, if you're going to investigate, don't do, I, I say, don't do a bunch of ambulance chasing. That's been done. Focus on one area, whether there's, a, there's been sightings there or not, focus on an area that you can get to, that you can be comfortable in. Cause if you're comfortable, 
um, you have a keener sense of your surroundings, you, you know. Um, so yeah, definitely get to know an area, get to know all the animals in that area uh, during all seasons, get to know all weather patterns, frequent that area, frequent that area. L always let someone know where you're going, have a game plan. You know, it's, a, it's like we teach or, you know, or we, during some of our public expeditions is, is have a game plan. You know, if you uh, don't have a, a plan to go from A to B and you don't know how to get back to your car, that, that that's going to be in your head. You lose your keys, uh, take, you know, pack accordingly, all that stuff, be prepared because the more prepared you are in the woods, the more you can actually conduct some really good investigation, investigative stuff, you know? And so, uh, yeah, um, I guess, and, and enjoy your time in the woods and don't expect anything to happen. And, and yeah, you know, be your biggest, um, you know, I guess, uh, skeptic. Yes, exactly. Be, be, be the, you gotta be skeptical. I mean, otherwise this thing, this, this whole phenomenon would have been explained a long time ago, you know, and nobody has a Sasquatch in their back pocket. Many people are doing wonderful, amazing research. I think that are some of them, I think are on the cusp of great things. Um, and uh, ask a lot of questions, ask a lot of questions, get to know people. Uh, don't take anything at face value, but uh, man, focus. If you're going to get into this, Folk, read, 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 read. And I mean, don't just read online. Get a freaking book and read a book. There's a lot of great books out there. A lot of knowledgeable people, but um, freaking one area, even just a small area. I just, I think that's so important. Once you get to know that area and the animals in there and the, the weather patterns and all that stuff, it'll make you, a, it just makes you more sound in your research. And then, you know, you can go to different areas if nothing's going on there. But I, when I say that, I mean, I got friends that have been areas for, and, and, many of you guys doing the same stuff uh, areas, you know, consistently four or five years and they know all, they can name the coyotes. They can name certain elk. And then when the elk disappears, they know, I mean, they just know. Mm -hmm. So I, that's, I think it's important and that's just good, good practice, you know, good practice, but also, you know, don't, don't, uh, you know, don't um, take the, I, I take this serious and, and many other people do, but don't take it so serious that you, um, you, lose uh, focus almost kind of in the lose, sense lose, yeah exactly but yeah i mean i i i do i take this phenomenon and the, my my personal work very serious i really do and i could say that honestly um you know maybe i'll get somewhere with it maybe i won't uh, i won't be the end all be all i love being in the woods and i love the people i work with and i i love investigating this phenomenon so yeah that's you know everybody hopefully can do the same you know and uh you know and avoid drama just avoid drama yeah, yeah. Turn, turn, turn the other cheek and walk away because it'll disappear. It'll come up and bite you once in a while, even if you're not yep. looking for it. But just, <laughs> just run like like it's the plague, and and, uh, and then someone else will be the focus of that uh, you know head chopping scenario than some other time. So who cares? <laughs> exactly, I, Shane. I couldn't have said it better. Um, Robert, any last thoughts? No, it's been a pleasure. It's been it's good talking to you. It's, we'll have to do this again. Absolutely, yeah, Robert, and, of, and uh, no, it's the part I like about the story, right? <laughs> the part I like about the story is we have these stories that we don't share with very many people, and they're on the back of our tongue. So we need to sit by a fire with nobody else around and just swap stories. It sounds like Robert, yes. I would, I would, I would absolutely love, absolutely love to sit next to a fire with you sometime and just swap stories and and uh, yeah, yeah, you're 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 a great guy, and I love the stuff you've done over the years, and um. And I'm glad Tate knows you, and, and uh, Tate, you're a great guy as well. And uh, I, I admire the Bluff Creek Project. I, I admire all the work down there. And man, uh, one of these days, I hope to sit next to fire with both of you guys. We got to oh. make that happen sometime soon. Yeah. <laughs> that was good, Shane. Thank you so much. Hey, thank yes. you. Thanks for having me on, guys. Enjoyed the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on, Shane. It's been a blast, and I enjoy talking to you as much as I enjoy being on monster x radio too so right on. appreciate that thank uh, you so until next time guys we've been the bluff creek project podcast have a great week <laughs>